Uh, as Scott said, my name is Andy Wickersham. Please call me Wick. Everybody calls me Wick. Everybody call my father Wick. Everybody call my grandfather Wick. So if somebody says Andy, I don't turn my head. You say Wick, you got my attention, okay? Uh, just to give you a little background about myself, uh, I've been cleaning for a paycheck since I've been 15 years old. So I've spent my life in the cleaning industry. I'm extremely proud uh, to do what I do for a living. Uh, I, I'm very honored to come and be able to speak with my peers this morning, so thank you very much for giving me some time today. Uh, you know, it's amazing. I've, I've been with Hilliard for about 30 years now, and uh, I've always started out with a, a small cleaning company in Central Missouri, when I, like I said, when I was 15. So, uh, and I always say this, I always learn something new every single day about what we do. Uh, I always say if we, when we stop learning, that's when we stop going. So. I always like to learn something new, and I learned the majority of uh, my new things now that our eye retires in St. Joseph, Missouri, where our factory is, but out here in the field where it actually where the rubber meets the road. Uh, and then about nine weeks ago, I actually uh, changed positions within our company. I'm now what they call a performance and development coach. Um, some people have been making fun of me, asking me where my coaching whistle is and my coaching shorts and my long, tall tube socks. But uh, so now, and, and the reason I'm uh, in the education and training department is because for years uh, the majority of my time is spent in the field working with professional cleaning people and, and so and doing training and education programs so I love to share information and uh, love to talk to people so that nine weeks ago they decided to let me do this full time so uh, in other words they said you like to talk for a living you could talk for two hours about your business card so here I am today with y'all uh, whenever I do these things, and I, like I said, I've done it for quite a while, every single time I speak to an audience, this front row is empty. <laughs> every single time. Now, there are two times that there is an empty front row, church on Sunday when Andy Wickersham comes to talk about cleaning. <laughs> so I'm not offended. It happens every single time. Uh, but I, I always say this too, ladies and gentlemen, uh, if you can walk away today, with one new idea that will make your jobs safer, more productive, and easier to do, then it's worth us spending some time together. And so I always like to start out with one thing is, that's called a safety data sheet. Does everybody know what they are? These wonderful little things that have replaced the old MSDS sheets. Uh, let me ask a question. Does anybody know how many sections are in the new SDS sheets? Too many. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> Did you say that, sir? You said that? I said that. Well, I'm not going to that. I was hoping somebody from our audience would say that. Well, let me ask you something about the SDS sheet. Does everybody know in your facilities where your SDS sheets are located? Okay. Let me ask you a follow-up question by the show of hands. Who's read them? <laughs> There's always one or two people in my audience that have read them. When I have trouble going to sleep at night. <laughs> you know, we're fixing to have some fun today. I can tell all that. Uh, the old MSDS sheets that, that we as manufacturer provided had nine sections. The new SDS sheets have 16 sections. Like you said, there's a bunch. Uh, I don't expect everybody to memorize all 16 sections of the new SDS sheets. However, I clearly understand that we're cleaning for the, the safe and well-being of the people that are in our facilities. But being a person who has dedicated his life to the life of cleaning, I want to ensure that we're as safe as possible too in the profession that we've chosen. So I want to ensure that you're as safe as possible. So if you're not going to memorize all 16 sections of the new SDS sheets, I want you all to be extremely aware of four sections. If you got a pen, please write them down. I want you to be familiar with section one. Do you ladies not have a pen? Can y'all get these ladies a pen, please? And it's, my, and it's my fault, too, because I'm the one who set all this stuff up, so I apologize for not having that. <laughs> Section 1 
gives you the name of the product and the name of the manufacturer. And oh, by the way, I did clear this by our Vice President of Regulatory Affairs, so he said it was okay for me to be able to say this too. I'm very careful about what I say. So Section 1 gives you the name of the manufacturer, the name of the product, the manufacturer's telephone number, and email address. Section 2 gives you what we refer to as the hazardous identification information. It tells you the potential hazards, it gives you what we call the signal word, and so on and so forth. And just to let you know, as a part of our training, what we provide is we do three types of training in Hilliard. We do off-site education like we're doing today. But we do on-site education where we come work side by side with you and your, your staff. But we also do online education. And so, for instance, from a hazardous communication standpoint or bloodborne pathogen training or the required training initially, that's all done online. So you have that available to you through us, through Clean Solutions, FYI. So Section 2 gives you your hazardous chemical identification information. Okay. Section 4 gives you the appropriate first aid information. What to do if there's an exposure. And while we're talking about exposure, there are three different types of exposure to a chemical. There's inhalation, absorption, and ingestion. In the housekeeping industry, which one do y'all think is the most prevalent? Ingestion, inhalation, or absorption? Just out of curiosity. Who said inhalation first? Was it? Well, I'll tell you what. It was a tie. Just to let you all know, it's actually inhalation. Would it be a fair assessment to say that most of us dispense our cleaning products with a handheld trigger sprayer bottle? 32 ounce core trigger sprayer bottle? Okay. What happens is, most of the time when we're uh, dispensing a cleaning product or a disinfectant or whatever with a 32 ounce core trigger sprayer bottle, many of us will set our spray nozzle on fine mist. So let me ask y'all a question. If I'm going to be cleaning this table here and I'm going to be spraying it with a cleaning product or a disinfectant product and I'm going to wipe it and let's say I've got a microfiber cloth, which I highly recommend, and I spray it and I've got a fine white mist and I've atomized that product and I spray and wipe it and it's atomized and I'm going in to wipe it, where's that product going to go? Right in my mucous membrane. So what OSHA not Hilliard, what OSHA recommends universally is to set your trigger sprayer stream on medium core spray. Not direct stream, but more medium core, so you're not atomizing. Okay, so that's very, very important. All right, so section four is going to give you your first aid information. And then section eight is going to give you the appropriate personal protective equipment you need when using the products. So, like I said, if you're not going to memorize all 16 sections, please become familiar with those four sections. Learn one new thing for the day so far? I said it's only one thing, so I'll see you all later. <laughs> okay. All right. Now, moving on. Whenever I, and I love to come and make new friends for a living. That's what I get to do. And I love to come see my new friends. And I always like to tell my new friends a story. And in 1984, when I came to work for the Hilliard Company, I'd been in the cleaning industry for a while. And one, and I've, I've been very fortunate to have quite a few different mentors in my career. And one of my mentors actually was a Hilliard fam family member. And when I came to work for the company, he set me down in a boardroom that had a chalkboard. And, of course, we didn't have back then these fancy projectors and these wonderful monitors and everything. We had a green chalkboard. And Mr. Hampton said, he said, Wick, he said, I want to share with you the secret of cleaning. I said, okay. He said, no, I'm serious. He said, there's a secret formula of cleaning. And he said, I believe this formula will never go out of style as long as buildings are being cleaned. And I said, you have my attention. So he went up to a chalkboard and he wrote the following. He said, there it is. I said, there's what? He said, there is the secret of cleaning. He said, this formula will never go out of style as long as buildings are clean. 
Now, I have to be honest with y'all because I'm an honest man. Uh, I did not exactly do real well in mathematics in high school. And, and so I thought, oh great, here's a fancy algebra formulation I'm going to have to figure out for the secret of cleaning. And Mr. Hamble said, no way. He said, you'll be able to figure this one out yourself. So C to the third power plus CE plus CP plus CT equals CB. There's the secret of cleaning. <laughs> And I was looking at him, kind of like y'all are looking at me right now, a little confused. So he banged his fist on the, on the table and he said, Wick, he said, in order to have a successful cleaning program, you must start out with C to the third power. And C to the third power simply means that if we're going to have a successful cleaning program, we must start out with a clean custodial closet. And I always get snickers, but is it important? Why is it important? Sell me. And oh, by the way, if I ask you a question, it is certainly all right to talk back to you. <laughs> Why is it important? So your things won't be contaminated. So your things won't be contaminated. So it could be a safety issue. Why else is it important? Yes, sir. Ah. You get this supplies a lot faster. You know, I'm in different public facilities almost every single day, talking to professionals in cleaning. And it seems like every single day, professionals in cleaning tell me, they say, well, you know, we have less and less time to do our jobs. It's like time, time, time. Well, you're exactly right, sir. If I have a closet, and oh, by the way, all the pictures you're seeing today was, were taken with my camera or my phone. So I didn't pull these off the internet. These are real life stories. So you're exactly right. So it's a time waster, isn't it? Or a time saver. So I, any other reasons why a clean custodial closet is important? I would say this. You betcha. I would also add this. Does the closet say something about the quality of the work? I would agree with that. I love it when heads shake up and down like this. This means we're going to have a great day today. So I think y'all would agree with me. Don't, we don't want to have closets that look like this, do we? Versus, I think y'all would agree with me, this is what we're looking for. This is a neat, clean, organized closet. And thank you for the amen. I always get one or two amen when I show this slide. Now I have to tell y'all another story. And I've used this formula ever since I started with the company because I believe it's that important. I was in Pella, Iowa. Anybody ever heard of Pella Windows? That's where they make, that says Pella, Iowa. Well in Pella, Iowa there happens to be a college by the name of Central College. And hands down, it, I've never seen a cleaner college in my entire career. Every building is spotless, spotless. And I had a young lady come up to me after I showed them, and she said, "What?" she said, have you ever talked to people about how the way they store their products? And I went, well, what do you mean? She said, I know it's commonsensical. She said, but we have always found that if we'll store our liquids below our disposables, in case there is ever a leak, we won't ruin a case of paper or case, case liners. I was like, you know what? That is a great idea. So I took a picture of her closet that showed her disposables stored below or above her chemicals. So it just makes sense. So I think y'all would agree with me that a clean custodial closet or seat of the third power is important, right? Good. So the next part of the formula is CE. How on earth can we maintain the building properly if we do not have clean equipment? I'm waiting for it. <laughs> Anybody see it yet? Yeah. Everybody see the dead mouse in the mop bucket doing the back <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that was not staged. Is that, is that stripper that he's in, or what? No, that's actually a floor finish bucket. Uh, uh -uh. 
You know, wasn't, wasn't our floor finished, by the way. It was his last shot. I, I was doing an initial building audit here, and I just happened to catch this. It's caught my eye. So let me ask this question. Why is clean equipment important? Yes. To get sufficient quality out of your work. I buy that. Good answer. <laughs> Why else is it important? Helps with preventative maintenance. Okay. So in other words, in order to stay to stay clean, we got to start clean. And in order to start clean, we got to clean and clean and clean equipment, right? Absolutely. I'm going to be giving all this away for him, even a quarter way through my own presentation today. We have more. Oh. <laughs> Fair enough. I would also say this, too, is I just made a statement a few moments ago that, yes, I'm concerned about the health and well-being of people that we're maintaining for. Because what do we want? We want clean, safe, healthy buildings at the lowest total cost. But once again, I'm also equally as concerned about the people doing the cleaning. And if we're working with dirty equipment, then it could potentially affect our health as well. Because what is in soil? Dirt and bacteria and viruses. Okay, so I want to make sure that if we're using clean equipment that our health is not being compromised. Let me give you another example. This is a million and a quarter square foot hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Now this fleet has since been replaced, but this fleet lasted for a long, long period of time because the Director of Environmental Services, who's a personal friend of mine, got sick and tired of years ago of checking equipment at the end of the shift and seeing recovery tanks not washed out properly, squeegee blades not washed out properly, vacuum cleaner bags that were overflowing and so on and so forth. So he came up with a real good idea to put a stop to that immediately. He started assigning a piece of equipment to one employee, and it was their responsibility to ensure that that piece of equipment was clean. And if it was not clean when they checked it, guess who got written up? It would only happen one time, I assure you, ladies and gentlemen. Because we clearly understand that clean equipment is so important. Don't you agree? Absolutely. So that's CE, clean equipment. So we have a clean custodial closet plus clean equipment. Now I believe, ladies and gentlemen, the next part of the formula is the most important part of the formula of all of it. I really do. CP. And CP simply means that if we're going to have a successful cleaning program, we must have caring people who take pride in their work. That is important, isn't it? And I will tell you all, Every single time I walk into a well-maintained facility, like the one that we're here today, I always like to find the person that's doing the cleaning and say, you know what, I've been in cleaning my whole life. I really appreciate the hard work that y'all are putting in here, because cleaning is hard work, isn't it? But I don't know of any other profession in the United States where we see a more direct reflection of our hard work than in our industry. And quite frankly, I try to preach pride wherever I go because what we do is so important because if we stop doing what we're doing, these buildings cease to exist, don't they? Absolutely. You know, so, and whether we're in an education facility, we're in a healthcare facility where we're worried about nosocomial infections, whether we're in the contracting industry or any other industry, it is so important. So I think pride is so important and I love to preach it on a daily basis. So, CP. Now, I always like to introduce my audience to one of the most incredible human beings I've ever met in my life. This beautiful human being on the right-hand side of the screen was a head custodian in a relatively small school district out in the middle of Kansas. Her name was Bobby. And Bobby took such pride in her work that at the end of the school year, her summer cleanup existed of two weeks. That's it. Because Bobby did such a beautiful job of maintaining her facility throughout the year, it did not take a whole lot of uh, resto restorative work at the end of the year to get her building back where it was. But Bobby also had a relationship with her students, and she would introduce herself to new students and say, look, 
I'm here as a partner in your educational process. And my staff and I go to great lengths to ensure that you have a clean, healthy environment to learn in. And I'd appreciate it if y'all wouldn't throw trash on the floor or write graffiti in our restrooms. Ladies and gentlemen, I literally saw a miracle take place one time. Somebody threw some trash on the floor one time when I was walking through a building with Bobby, and another student actually picked it up and put it in the trash. I about <laughs> fell over. <laughs> Unfortunately, three years ago, we lost her to breast cancer and broke my heart because this is one of the most incredible people I ever met in my life. And I promised her when I found out she was sick, I would take her picture with me for the rest of my career. A little personal with me, a little emotional, but once again, I really enjoy seeing my friends for a living. So, clean custodial closet plus clean equipment plus caring people who take pride in your work plus CT, the final part of the formula. We must keep up with current technique and current technology. When I started cleaning for a living in 1975, I was mopping floors with a 32 ounce cotton mop and what they called a gear press mop bucket, galvanized metal. I don't know if anybody's been in our business long enough to remember those things, but those buckets and those ringers, if you ever dropped one on your toe, which I have. Yeah, and you know, the darndest thing about that is back then I was five foot five, 110 pounds, swinging a 32 ounce cotton mop wet, weighed 22 pounds. Now my little forearm started looking like pie pie. And the rest of my body was skinny as heck. Well today, today, we're not mopping our floors with 32 ounce cotton mops and galvanized metal buckets. My goodness, we're cleaning our floors with stand on and ride on scrubbers. Why? Because they're productive. They're be you know, they, they clean better in less time. So technology has come a long way. You know, now we're using floor machines that are no longer round, they're square, and they don't require a lot of training, which we're gonna see today if you haven't seen them, they're wonderful. So we must keep up with current technique, technology, and I would also add training. Like I said, that's why we believe very strongly at Hilliard that online training, on-site training, and off-site training, or what we refer to as blended training, is very important. So if we have a clean custodial closet, clean equipment, caring people who take pride in the work, and we keep up with current technique, technology, and training, then we should have cleaner buildings. Y'all agree with that? Good. The only thing that I ask is, in the future, if you use this formula, just give me credit for it the first three times you use 49 years. I'd appreciate it. Okay. So. Let's move on. to the matter at hand. Now, let me also tell you all something. Uh, about 20 years ago, I was in St. Louis, Missouri, and I was in a large school district there, and I was doing a program like this, and uh, I had a, a head custodian. She was a, let's just say, a very aggressive woman. She's very professional. But after she got, I got done with my session, she said, wait, can you take some constructive advice? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, you said you've been in cleaning your whole life. I said, yes, ma'am. She said, well, my advice to you is never, ever have your audience sit down from morning out or hour at a time. And I said, well, why is that? She said, because quite frankly, young man, I was young back then, she said, you know, like I know, my mind will absorb what my backside can handle. She said, never have your audience sitting down from morning hour at a time. So I'm telling y'all, I won't have y'all sitting down from morning hour at a time today, okay? Is that a deal? Okay, all right, so what we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk about renovating finished floors. 
But before we get into reno reno uh, talking about renovation of floors and floor care in general, why do we why do we put finish on floors in the first place? Why 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 do we do that? Well, <laughs> you know, all in one one, you hit two already for crying out loud. <laughs> Would everybody agree that we put finish on floors for appearance yes. and protection? <coughs> Absolutely. Because we're protecting the investment. You know, facilities spend hundreds of thousands of dollars, even millions of dollars on floor coverings, and we have to protect them, right? And so, yes, we finish them to protect them. But we also finish them for appearance because here in the United States, people associate clean facilities with clean floors, do they not? As a matter of fact, whenever we walk into a grocery store when we're in the cleaning industry, where do we look? We ain't looking this way, are we? Well, we're looking this way when we walk in the door because we're looking at the glass, not to see what's on the other side of it. We're looking to see if there's smudges on the glass. Then when we walk in the door, then where do we look? We look down, don't we? And then after that, where do we look? We go into the restroom to see if the restroom is clean. Because we can judge a building's cleanliness by restrooms and floors, right? Absolutely. So appearance and protection. I would also tell you there is another very important reason why we put finish on floors, and that is for safety. All right, a finished floor on a resilient floor, and I'm talking about 12 by 12 vinyl composition flooring that has finish on it is safer than a unfinished floor. Why do we know that? Because we've done scientific research for many, many years. And there's a measurement that we use that, for instance, there's an organization called Underwriters Laboratory. And they use a scientific measurement system called the static coefficient of friction. So what they do is they test the friction of a floor and they use what we refer to as a James machine. And they will coat a floor and they'll put the James machine on it and it's, it's a real simplistic looking piece of equipment. It's got a shoe heel on there and it applies pressure. And when it gets to a certain pressure, it releases the shoe heel. It slips it. Well, they know the static coefficient of friction of a finished floor has better friction than an unfinished floor. So it's also a safety issue as well. So we coat floors for appearance, for protection and for safety, okay? So that's the main reasons why we tend to coat and protect our floors. Now, what we're gonna talk about this morning is the renovation procedures of floor care. And so what I would like to cover this morning is the procedures involved in finishing floors, the refinishing process because there's a big difference in process versus procedure. We'll break that down here in a minute. And what are the advantages and disadvantages of each process? Then we're also going to talk about determining what is the best process that works for us within our given facilities. Because every facility is not the same, are they? Just like every floor is not the same. Oh, by the way, let me ask this question. I don't know about down here, but for where I'm from, we don't have 100% level floors. Y'all got 100% level floors around here? No. Okay. So sometimes there are different processes depending upon the flooring surfaces that we're dealing with. Okay. And then we're going to also talk about when is the best time, appropriate time to refinish or restore our floors. So that's what we want to cover this morning. And then, like Scott said, what we're going to do is, after we're done here, we're going to get up and we're actually going to go out in uh, their, their demonstration area and we're going to do some hands-on and let everybody kind of see what we're talking about here this morning. So, when we look at a cleaning program, we look at a cleaning program three different ways. We break it down by routine maintenance, interim maintenance, and restorative maintenance. Now, of those three, routine, interim, and restorative, which one do y'all think is the most expensive? Restorative. Why is that? Because 
more money for it. Yeah, so it takes more time, doesn't it? And time is money. Absolutely. So the bottom line is if we do a better job of routine maintenance, we're going to spend less money on restorative maintenance, right? And if we do a better job of interim maintenance, we're going to do a less restorative maintenance. I mean, it's very simplistic, really. But so many times we get to the point, we let things go to the point where we have to do renovations. So there's some very clear lines that we need to be thinking about from a routine and interim maintenance so we can reduce the number of hours and time that we spend on renovation or restorative maintenance. So, whenever we break down, and there's three key factors that we like to talk about as far as successful floor care. And if you talk to industry quote unquote experts all over the country, they will say the three important things are simplification, standardization, and mechanization. And when we talk about simplification and standardization, we break it down into what we call processes. So there are processes in floor care, there are processes in carpet care, there are processes in restroom care, there is processes in infection prevention, and so on and so forth. But under the heading of processes, there are procedures involved in a cleaning process. And so what we want people to do, especially when it comes to floor care is, we want everybody to be able to standardize their processes and procedures as much as we possibly can. You know, I like to refer to that little company out of Chicago, Illinois that has the golden arches. You know the one I'm talking about? I don't know if you all have ever noticed this, but it doesn't matter if I come into, by the way, who is that? I think he said it first. You're right. I was referring to Mickey D's. I don't care if you're in Jonesboro, Arkansas, Memphis, Tennessee, New York City, or Los Angeles, California. If you walk into McDonald's and you look to your left, french fries are always on the left. If you look on your right, milkshakes are always on the right. Why? Because they clearly understand the need for standardization, mechanization, and simplification. So what they do is they have processes for each one of those areas, and in those processes they have procedures. So it's standardized. Isn't that what we really want to do in cleaning and facility maintenance? So that's why when we have a process, we recommend the procedures to be followed under that process. So, also, many procedures are determined by the floor type that we're dealing with and the finish type that we're dealing with. Ladies and gentlemen, I would love to be able to tell you all that I have one floor care product that covers all of these areas. That would make life a lot simpler, wouldn't it, from a standardization process. For resilient flooring alone, we manufacture 13 different products. <laughs> okay? So, depending upon the floor that we're dealing with, depending upon the maintenance program that we have, depending upon the labor that we have, depending upon the equipment we have, will determine what process that we're going to use. But then, once again, under those processes, we're going to have procedures. Now, I always like to tell people this, is if you're never sure about something, before you call your rep or call us, and I want you all to have our 800 number by the end of the day, because I want to give you all access to our technical service people. If you have a problem in your facility or you have a problem with a, dog, a pet odor at home, you can call us and we can be a good resource. But I always tell people before you do that, read the label because we put all of our information on the label. So for instance, on a floor stripper, we will tell you what floors you can and what floors you cannot apply that floor stripper to. We will also tell you the right mixture of that floor stripper. We will also tell you, can anybody read what that says under, uh, pre, under uh, application? What's that first line say under application? Do not use with hot water or spray. Uh -oh. uh, <laughs> 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 
You got me. You got me excited. <laughs> I'm coming with my fiber cloth your way, by the way. <laughs> And that's the first thing everybody wants to do, is run that water until it gets completely hot. I Why don't, is that? I don't, they think it stays hot all day. I don't know. <laughs> I try to tell them they don't listen. That's because they think everything cleans better with hot water. 97% of the products that we manufacture in St. Joseph, Missouri, are designed to be used with cold water. Now, let me give you an example. This particular floor stripper right here is the strongest acting floor stripper in the whole floor care industry, hands down. Why? Because it's a 100% active ingredient. There is no water in there. Now, if I take this, and by the way, it's a half a gallon to five gallons of water, so that's a one to 10 dilution ratio. Most people strippers at one to four. But if I take this stripper, and I mix five gallons of hot, hot water, and I pour this half gallon into that hot water, you know what's gonna happen? All the ingredients in this product are gonna flash right out in the atmosphere and I've got nothing but water. And then I get a phone call and they'll say, Wick, and this has happened to me, I don't know how many times. I used to be a direct sales representative in Kansas City, Missouri, and I'd have somebody strip in a bank lobby. I'd get a call on a Saturday morning and they'd say, Wick, your stripper isn't working where did that gum. And they'd say, we need you to come down. So I'd go down and I'd say, well, let's mix some stripper up. So we would go to the closet. We would get a bucket. And then they would turn on that water as, you know, come on, say it for me. Hot. they say it as hot as they possibly could. And I'd say, therein lies our problem. Okay? So once again, we have, if we're not sure, read the label. Because we put a lot of good information on that label. Okay. Now, albeit our, our label direction is getting smaller and smaller because we put two different languages on our labels today, plus all the other new requirements for hazardous communication makes us put a lot of other information on there. Okay. As a matter of fact, have you all started seeing these little diamonds showing up on container labels? You know what those are? They're called pictograms. And if you take our online has this communication program, you'll find out exactly what those pictograms mean. By the way, we don't charge for that. We supply that to our customers, okay? We want you to be informed. We want your employees to be informed. But start with reading the label, please. Because there's a lot of great information that we put on the label. All right, so once again, when I talked about procedures underneath the process, when we talk about forecare, we have all these procedures involved. Move furniture, dust mop, damp mop, flood mop, scrub with standard single disc or square floor machine, scrape floor, wet back, test before plumbing seal or finish, grind time. Do we use a seal or a finish? We're going to talk about all these things. But the thing about it is we know is the more proficient we are at each, pr each procedure under a process, that will carry us into other types of cleaning and make us more efficient in other types of cleaning. But the first thing that we do is we always like to start with moving any movable furniture that we can if we're going to strip a floor. Anybody ever had a uh, floor that they were going to strip and they pulled up a filing cabinet and they found rust underneath it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah? How'd you deal with it? And what if that don't come off? What if it's gotten into the tile? Then what do you do? Well, I'll tell you what we recommend as a best practice. If you get to the point where you've got rust on tile, take a specific cream cleanser with a very mild jeweler's rouge abrasive, and it will, more times than not, remove that rust. Okay? But when you do that, make sure that you rinse that mild abrasive cleanser very well with water. We don't want any of that residue left behind. But it will effectively remove rust off a floor. Also, well, uh, I, I know a product called Cream Clean that does it, but. How do you apply it, I like to do it either with a, a sponge or a cloth. Just scrub the hands. Yes. Also, you know the little area where carpet 
uh, buds up to a, a floor, a tile floor, and you got that little metal strip, and most of the time it's gold in color, you can take that same cream cleanser and wipe it off and it cleans it up real good too. Okay, but the bottom line is what we want to do is we want to remove as much of that removable furniture as we possibly can. Would that work on a rubber one? Rubber seal? No. No, be very careful on rubber. Okay. Because rubber is completely different than vinyl. Okay, you gotta be really careful. And like anything else, guys, if you're never sure about a certain product, always go over into a corner or what we call an inconspicuous area and test a product to make sure there's not gonna be any what what Sometimes I hang around these chemists so long, guys, they, they use these fancy words like deleterious effect and stuff like that. Any damaging effect is what I like to say in, in my, my terms, okay? Another important thing that we need to do when we're in a floor renovation process, whether we're doing a strip out or a strip and recoat, is we always, always dust mop that floor first. And I always like to take a broom into the edges and corners and sweep it out before I run that dust mop. The reason we recommend doing that, has anybody ever put floor finish in an office or a classroom and then you get to the final part and when it dries you, you see little indentations there at the doorway? More times than not, what that is is that's particulate matter that's been left on the floor during the strip or scrub and recoat process. And when we've used a micro, especially with microfiber, you're pulling that stuff to the door and then you pull the mop up and it just dries right there in the finish. And many times that's a matter of not pre-sweeping the floor. So as my partner in tech services in St. Joe always says, thou shalt dust mop the floor first before anything. Okay? So very important to pick up that debris. Okay, when we damp mop, we're going to damp mop after we do our stripping and flood rinsing process. So damp mopping is very important. And you know, damp mopping simply means that we are only going to put down a minimal amount of clean water solution on the floor. Versus this, flood mopping, we're going to flood mop like our stripper because we want that material to start breaking down the finish on the floor or our general purpose cleaner, we're going to do a scrub and reed coat. Now, if we're flood mopping as a part of our regular maintenance, if we have a really dirty floor, if we flood mop a floor or over wet a floor, what can happen is if we don't pick that material up, you know, detergent, clean floor cleaners will hold soil like a magnet. But if it's not removed, it's going to dry on the floor and then you're going to have a dull, sticky floor. Okay, so once again, if we're flood mopping, we need to get that material off the floor. So in stripping, we're going to wet bag it. In scrub and rico, we're going to wet bag it. But if I'm using it in a cleaning process, I need to make sure after that material has dissolved the finish on the floor, or the soil, we need to remove it. Because there are four letters that are the secret to all cleaning products. It's called TACT, T-A-C-T. All cleaning products need a certain amount of time to work. All products need agitation to mix with the soil. All products need the appropriate concentration, the right mixture. And while we're talking about mixture, has anybody ever done this? Don't know if it ever happened to you, happened to me. Uh, when I had a bulk gallon container of material, and it said I'll use four ounces per gallon, and I didn't have a measuring cup or a mixing cup, and I went, well, let's see. If one glug is good, five is better. Anybody ever had that happen? Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to tell you that more is not better. Okay, so we have to have the right concentration. That's why chemical dilution control dispensers are so important today. Because they mix the product at the appropriate dilution ratio. They take uh, the exposure uh, potential of us being exposed to a raw concentrate out of the picture. So we have to have the right con concentration. So we need time, agitation, concentration, and temperature. Temperature is the final one. And I just stated that 97% of the products we manufacture today are designed to be used with cold water. Okay. So, flood mopping is another procedure in the floor care process. Wet backing is another procedure. Now, I don't know about y'all, but I like to have these new wet backs. If I'm going to be doing wet floor cleaning, I like to have a wet back with a floor mounted squeegee on it. 
Because when I first got in the business, they put me on a wet dry back with a hose and a wand, and we were stripping 10,000 square foot. Now, uh, mind you, I always thought that the toughest job was the guy on the floor machine. I, I thought that was the toughest job. Then after I learned how to use it, then I, then I figured out why my supervisor was on that floor machine and not on the wet back. He referred to it as Nicky the new guy syndrome. He said, since you're the new guy, you're going to use the wet back and you're going to go back and forth to the closet and fetch fresh water for the buckets. But once again, having the right wet vacuum is so important. Okay, then depending upon the equipment we have available, if we have to use a single disc floor machine, okay, if we're using just a standard single disc floor machine, the adjustment for the height of the handle is extremely important. It needs to be right here at our center, okay? Because if it's too high, what happens is it'll get away from us. And if you're ever educating somebody on, if you have an older floor machine and you do have to train somebody on, here's what I always tell people, relax. But I always mount the floor machine motor housing with my knees so when they turn it on, it's not gonna do what? <laughs> because here's what happens is, if somebody is being trained on a single disc floor machine, what happens is they'll turn the machine on, they get nervous, and they do this. Well, when you do this, when you raise, the floor machine goes right. When you lower it, it goes left. Okay? Once again, that's why I like the new square machines because there's no torque to them whatsoever. You can take one hand and turn it on and it oscillates, and you can just do it, and that's someone who's never run a floor machine in their life. But if you have to use a floor machine, it does need to be properly centered in your set. Or for those who ride motorcycles, some people will put their hip forward. I personally prefer to have it right here at hip weight, and I like to move in a side-by-side -side motion, just like so. Okay? You know, and then once again, it's what we call RRLL, raise right, lower left. But once again, with technology, you know, it's something that we're, we're seeing a lot of new programs and equipment out there to make our lives easier. Now, one thing about it too, is if we do have to use a single disc floor machine and we start stripping against edges and walls and baseboards, we always want to go from right to left against the edge and the wall. Here's what happens. If I go left or right, it's going to splash the stripping solution right to the baseboard. If I'm going right to left, it brings the stripper away from the baseboard, therefore reducing the amount of stripping solution that's being splashed on the baseboard. Now, the new method is what we refer to as green floor renovation. And y'all are going to see that today, utilizing what we call the square scrub. It is an oscillating machine that is square. So what happens is it oscillates and so it doesn't have any torque. But it also, because it's square, it gets into corners very nicely. But the beauty about this new technology too, ladies and gentlemen, is you can use it dry or you can use it wet. You can also use it to restore grout. You can use it to polish concrete. You can use it for carpet. There are many different things you can use this new technology on. All right, so it's wonderful, easy to use technology. But once again, this is a part of a procedure that we really recommend people take a look at because it's very safe and very effective to use. Makes sense, doesn't it? See all the square scrub people in the back one? Yep, and it does a lot of sense, okay? All right, edges is another procedure. Now, anybody in here ever have to strip finish off edges and baseboards? Is that any fun? Well, let me ask this question. Why do we have to do edge work? What, what, what causes that? Okay, and let's, let's talk about when we're putting floor finish down. How does floor finish get on the baseboard? <laughs> See, I was looking. Yeah, me too. But that's reason number 10,001 why we use a microfiber flat finish mop today because it keeps the finish off the baseboard. Now I'm going to give you one other little hint that's huge too, is if you have baseboards, 
that have no finish on them now, and you have to wet strip in the future. Take a high quality dust mop dressing, spray it on a rag over a trash can, and pre-wipe the baseboard. What will happen is, if you do that, it will not allow stripping solution to shit to dry on the baseboard. You can come back an hour later and wipe it right off. You can also treat stainless steel with that. You can write it on partitions in restrooms. Kids can't write graffiti. See, I like one product to do as many things as possible. I do not feel we need 10 million different products to clean the building, ladies and gentlemen. And this is coming from a man who still has his last child to put through college. Okay, so take some of that dust mop dressing, put it, apply it to the baseboard. Do not get it on the floor. Let's spray it on a rag over a trash can, wipe it, and it will shed that stripping solution on the baseboard. It really, really does work. We've been doing it for many years. But let's keep that finish off the baseboards. Now, the final scientific method that we utilize before we put any seal or finish on a freshly stripped or scrubbed floor, this scientific method is really, really complicated. We take our hand, we wipe it on our floor. If our hands clean, so is the floor, right? If we come up with a white residue or a gray residue on our hand, there's still alkalinity on the floor. We need to go back and rinse again. But I will tell you all, sure as I'm sitting here, if we do the proper job of what we call neutralizing and damp mop rinsing, I have never had to go back and rinse a floor again. Because once again, I followed the procedure properly in the process. All right, and we're going to talk about what that is here in a little bit. When we apply seal and finish on a floor, like we're going to do today, once again, guys, there's always more than one way to do something, is there? Always. Okay, but what I like to do is build my perimeter first whenever I'm putting applying floor finish first, so I can work within the confines of that perimeter. Okay, then what I like to do, because y'all just told me your floors aren't even down here either. So if it's a big enough area, I'm going to apply the next coat in the opposite direction. So I don't have any voids or holidays. Alright. Then what I'm going to do is I want to work in about 10 foot widths. Now I'll tell y'all something. I don't know about y'all, but I fight change. Y'all ever fight change? I get comfortable doing something. I don't want to try something new because it's uncomfortable. Matter of fact, let me all give you a little demonstration of what it feels like to change. And where I'm going with this is, for years, I put floor finish down with a string mop. Then my boss came to me and said, Wick, I want you to try this new microfiber flat mop. I said, no, thank you. I'm comfortable. He said, no, I want you to try it. And after darn near twisting my arm off, I tried it. And I like it. But here's what it feels like to change. Everybody just cross your arms like you normally do. Just cross your arms for me. Now what I want y'all to do is cross them in the opposite direction and hold it there. That's what it's like to change. Okay? I have been introduced to a new technique recently of laying floor finish with a flat mop that I did not know worked, but I'm starting to believe in it. And I'm starting to talk about it. Because if I can make your life easier and better, more product productive, it's better. I, because I used a string mop for years, I would lay out my perimeter, I would work in 10 foot areas, I would cut a U shape, and then I would figure eight my mop, right? And so I started using a microfiber flat mop and I started doing the same thing. I would draw out my perimeter and I would do a figure eight, right? What I have found now is, is that if I will draw out my perimeter, only a third of it, and then take my microfiber mop and make myself a well here and go across the well, back over it, come down, back, across the same area like this, I get a much more even lay on my floor finish. Whether it's low solid, high solid, it does not matter. And it gives me a nice even coat and there is no way I'm going to have any boys or holidays doing that. Okay? So laying our finish, once again, very important procedure in the process. Dry time. You know, I always say, if you're going to, especially in facilities like educational facilities, go do something else. Go prep another floor. Don't just sit there and wait to finish to dry like watching paint dry, okay? Always something else we can do. All right, now, when we talk about time, we talk about the importance of routine maintenance, intra-maintenance, and restorative maintenance. 
It's all about time. So when we look at the amount of time just to strip a floor versus scrub and recoat a floor, the International Sanitary Supply Association, and they do cleaning standard times all the time. As a matter of fact, this last round they came out with 612 different cleaning times. And what they will do is they will say, okay, it takes this long to strip a floor, this long to scrub and recoat a floor, and they average it out. So just to strip a floor, just to strip a floor, they figure about 120 minutes per thousand square foot to strip a floor. To scrub a floor, to do a scrub and recoat, they estimate it should take about 60 minutes per thousand square foot. That's half last time I checked, is it not? Now to do the new dry process with the square machine you're going to see if we do it dry, it's 30 minutes per thousand square foot. Once again, that's a huge time saver, don't you agree? So we really need to be able to look at this new, going back to that new technique and new, te new technology. Okay. And once again, if you're not familiar with these time standards, get with your local rep. They can get you these time standards all day long. And there are other programs that we have available that apply to it today too. Okay. Okay. Now, another thing that we want to do is we want to move the furniture if we're going to strip we want to dust mop then what we want to do is we want to dam up our doors so our stripper doesn't leak underneath our doors right that's why i like to have something like this that's a door stopper or a door dam that will fit in the door and it's it's flexible so it jams up so it will keep that stripping solution from leaking out into an unfinished or a finished area but i also like to have turkish toweling terry claw toweling soaked in neutralizer backing that up just to ensure or as i had stated earlier and we all agreed there's always more than one way to do some cardboard works very well too to act as a door dam but the important thing is is that we build a dam to ensure that it's not going to run under doors or get splashed on the carpet because stripper will negatively affect finished floors and carpet unfortunately i'm sure we've all seen it at one time or another Okay, then what we want to do is, when we're going to strip a floor, we're going to mix our stripper properly, but we're going to read that SDS sheet first, right? We're going to go to section eight. We're going to see what kind of personal protective equipment we need. Do I need eye protection? Do I need gloves? The answer is yes to all the above, by the way. But then I want to ensure that I have all my equipment in the area. If I have a large facility, and I have to go to an area, I like to have a flat cart that will hold my floor machine, my wet vac, and three buckets, and two ringers, and my mops. And by the way, too, this is something that I had somebody show me several years ago that I love. If I have three mop buckets in a wet stripping operation, and they're all yellow, and I have three different handles with three different mops, okay, if you notice, it's a red label. So why not take a piece of red tape and put it around my stripper handle on my stripper mop and put that red tape on the bucket that I'm using for stripper? Okay, my neutralizer is blue. Why not put a blue piece of tape around the neutralizer handle in the neutralizer bucket? And then either don't put any color or put the color yellow on my bucket. So it color codes my buckets and my mops. Because I don't know how many times I've done a floor and then we go back and it's like, now which mop and bucket did I did if we go for a break or something? So it easily color codes and identifies the bucket and the mop. But when we apply the stripper to the floor, we only want to work in 10 foot sections, 10 by 10. No more than 250 square foot. Why? Because we don't want to dry up on us. Now I'm going to get a little technical with you guys. Here's the reason why. Number one, we don't want to dry it up on us because we don't want to have to go back and strip it again, right? Well, here's where I'm going to give a little talk about chemistry. Floor finish. Okay? And I don't care whose floor finish it is. I don't care if it's Hilliard or other one other major manufacturers. In 90% of our finishes, we use what they call polymers, which is the workhorse of the finish. It's what gives a fin floor finish its durability. But we put a lot of other ingredients in floor finish, and we tie it all together with what's called zinc. I don't know if anybody has ever heard the term metal interlock finish. Metal interlock is zinc that ties everything together. Well, metal interlock or zinc is also what allows us to strip the floor. 
when we apply stripper to the floor and the floor finish, it, the zinc helps break down the rest of the finish. Now, if I've stripped an area that's too large and that stripper dries up, I've gotten rid of the zinc. Now that, that finish dries back together without any zinc and it can sometimes be impossible to strip off that finish a second time. That's why it is so important that we work with manageable areas. So we, work, we say work no more than 10 by 10 or 10 by 15 sections at the most. Does that make sense? Okay, so we don't want that finish. And so what I'll do is I will go ahead and I will apply the stripper to that section. I'll let it set, then I'll go back and apply it again. Especially if I have multiple coats. Now I will tell you, my stripper, as I stated, this is there is no more fast acting stripper in the industry. That is an absolute fact. There's some good strippers out there, but that will effectively remove in one application eight to ten coats. In one application. Now I've used a propane stripping machine with that, and I've removed 16 coats of finishing one application. Okay, but I worked it in manageable areas. And oh, by the way, how can I tell how much finish is on the floor? Can y'all tell me how I can tell? And we're going to get into how much uh, square footage of a gallon of finish you cover here in a little bit. But can you, how can you tell? Did anybody tell me? There's one way you can tell is if it's a 12 by 12 vinyl composition floor. And at the seam of the floor, if you can take your fingernail and scratch the seam and you can't feel the seam, you've got a minimum of 10 coats on that floor. Now, how many coats should I have on that floor? How many? Six, three. Hold on to that thought. We're going to get there in a minute. How much we recommend from a manufacturer standpoint. Okay, then after we put our stripper on the floor and we let it dwell the proper amount of dwell time, then we're going to remove it with our machine. Because once again, we're going to braid that finish, whether it's a single disc or once again, the new square machine you're going to see today. Okay, now one thing I also recommend is if you are stripping with a round single disc floor machine, before you put that machine on the floor, take that stripping pad that's dry and lubricate it in your stripper. Don't put the, the dry pad on the floor because here's what happens, is if you have a lot of floor finish on the floor and, that, and you put that dry pad on there, it's going to cake up a lot faster. So pre-lubricate that floor pad and stripper before you put it underneath the floor machine. Okay. That way you'll extend the amount of square footage that you're using with that stripping pad. And that includes the hypro pad too. One thing I recommend is if you are using a hypro pad with a single disc floor machine, put that, put a white pad underneath it first and then that will act as a shock absorber, then put your black hypro stripping pad underneath it. That really helps too if you have un uneven floors, which y'all just told me y'all do have some uneven floors around here, okay? Okay, then it's also recommended in a stripping crew that if when we're stripping utilizing a wet dry vacuum, we want to maintain a minimum of three foot distance between the machine and the wet vac. That way the machine is not going to be splashing stripping slurry back onto our previously uh, area that, that the, the stripper has been picked up. All right, so we won't, don't want to follow too closely. Okay, then after we pick up the stripping solution, then what we want to do is we want to neutralize the floor. Okay, with some type of floor neutralizer. It's very important. And the reason it's very important is because neutralizer, our strippers have what we call a lot of high alkalinity in there. If you've ever seen that white residue from stripping solution, that's alkalinity. What neutralizer does is it brings down and gets rid of the alkalinity. Now, I've had some people over the years say, well, we I use vinegar. It's acidic, okay? Well, it's very acidic, and you have to use eight ounces per gallon. Okay, so if I have three gallons in a bucket, that's 24 ounces. That's three full cups. You know, with this, with the packet, I have to do one packet for three gallon, or if I'm using the liquid, I like to use four ounces per gallon. 
Now, remember when I was talking earlier about the super hill tone, dust mop dressing on the baseboards, and I wanted to do as many things as possible? Do y'all ever get any ice or snow down in this neck of the woods? Do you ever have to deal with ice melt compound? Okay, and does that leave a white residue on your floors when it gets trapped in your buildings? That residue is alkalinity. It's just like what's in the stripper. Neutral cleaner will not remove it, even if you run through your scrubber. So, that's another thing that the neutralizer will do is it will get rid of that white alkaline residue left behind by your ice melt compound. Okay, and it also does a good job of cleaning. It has what's called a chelating agent in there. Vinegar does not have a chelating agent in there. So I can use it for more than one thing. And oh, by the way, what I like to use the neutralizer too for is, is in carpet extraction. I will apply carpet pre-spray to the carpet. I will put the neutralizer in the solution tank of my extractor and it neutralizes and flushes out all the residue out of your carpet. So having a good neutralizer is extremely important in, floor, in the floor care process. All right. So I'm going to strip the floor, I'm going to wet back the floor, I'm going to do my first rinse, flood rinse with the neutralizer. Then I'm going to let that set for only five minutes. It's not going to, nothing's going to happen if it sets more than five minutes. Within the first five minutes, that neutralizer is going to do all that it's going to do. Then I'm going to follow that up with two damn hot rinses, okay? Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to test the floor when it dries to see if the floor is clean. If the, my hand's clean, so is the floor, it's ready for finish. Oh, by the way, I'm asked this a lot, Andy, can I use a fan to dry that floor after my final rinse? The answer is yes. But if you have a lot of dust in an area, make sure it's well dusted, because you don't want to be moving a bunch of air and have dust and particulate matter fall back on a freshly clean floor. However, we never put fans on directly on floor finish to dry it, ever. We can put it up this way to move some air, but you never want to flash dry a floor finish with a fan. Okay, so we've got our floor stripped. Now we need to coat the floor. Okay, the most amount of finish we ever really want to see, and this is based on perfect temperature and humidity, is no more than five coats in one shift, preferably four. Because if you stack too many coats too fast, you're going to have a problem. Anybody ever uh, stacked finish on a floor and had a chair stick to a floor? Or a table leg stick to a floor? What has happened is, is that's what our chemists call uh, plasticizer migration. There are plasticizers in the finish, there are plasticizers in the tile. And if you stack too many and it's not allowed to dry and cure properly, what happens is it acts like glue, and it holds. I've actually seen it so bad where people have, we pull tile off the floor with a chair. So giving the right amount of time between coats and not stacking too many coats in one shift is so important. Once again, if you're not sure, it's on the label. Read the label, or once again, call your rep. Okay. Now, how do I know if a floor of a previous coat of finish is ready to put. There are several things you can do. Okay, first of all, you know, what I like to do is take the back of my hand, not the top of my hand, the back of my hand, and see if it's tacky. Okay, I had a custodian out up in Nebraska one time show me he took a, a eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper and just slid it across the floor. He said when there's no drag, that's when he puts another coat down. Same thing with your floor finish mop. When you start applying it, if you feel any drag whatsoever, stop. It is not ready yet. That previous coat is still drying. And by the way, all floor finish takes about 24 to 48 hours to totally cure out. Sometimes 72, depending upon tension and humidity. So we gotta be careful not to stack too many coats. Okay guys, let's do this real quick. Can you stand up for me just real quick? Don't, don't leave, but just stand up. I want to keep good to my word. Okay, we're good. Like I say, what we're going to do is here in about 20 minutes, guys, is we're going to wrap this up and we're going to actually go physically do some hands-on stuff here, okay? So, I won't have you sitting down for very much longer, I promise. Like I said, I want to come see my friends again. Okay, so we need to make sure that that 
the previous coat is dry before we apply the next coat. Now, what size screw should we have? Well, that's going to depend upon the size of the area that we're stripping, okay, how many people are available, and the equipment available. You know, if I'm wet stripping, normally I'll see a crew of three. One person applies a stripper and they go back and forth and get clean solution. One person's running a floor machine and one person's using a wet bag. Okay, that would be optimum. Sometimes I only have one person. I'll ask who's the floor crew and that person will raise their hand like this gentleman and said, said, I'm it. Okay. But once again, too, that's a nice thing about the dry process, you can see, is we can take one person to do the job of three. Like using an auto scrubber and a deep scrub and a recoat. I can do the job of three people with one person if I've got a good auto scrubber with 80 pounds of pad pressure minimum. Okay, you know, once again, I, I, the, the thing about the floor crew, though, is if I have multiple people on a floor crew, the floor stripping and renovating process is like a dance. If everybody stays in sync, everything's cool, but if, if some one person gets out of sync, sync it throws off the, throw, the whole process. So once again, I want to ensure that before I take somebody new out to a stripping area that they've gone through a good training session. Really important. Okay, on the top scrub and retail process, that's where I want to use a general purpose cleaner, not a neutral cleaner. Okay, our minds have changed on that. We want to use a good new general purpose cleaner to effectively remove the top two coats of finish on the floor without stripping it. And that's where our general purpose. A lot of people will take a neutral cleaner and strip the floor. The problem with that is a couple fold. Number one, if you have an area like in a cafeteria that has a lot of food grease and soil and you try to use a neutral cleaner, it will not effectively remove the soil, whereas a general purpose cleaner with a higher pH will. Has anybody ever seen finish where you did a scrub and recoat and you had separation of the finish? It looked like it's separating. What has happened is we didn't get all the residue off the floor, okay? And so that can happen with food, oil, and grease, but it can also happen where you're mopping floors with disinfectant. That residue from what we call quaternary ammonium chloride or quat if it's not effectively scrubbed off the floor, it will also contribute to finish separation in a scrub and recoat. So you need to make sure that you use a good general purpose cleaner when you're wet scrubbing for interim maintenance. Okay, once again, we use the same three, three foot rule uh, between the floor machine and the wet back deal for wet scrubbing. Okay, then after I pick that up, once again, because it's a, a higher alkaline product, I want to use my neutralizer again to flood rinse. And now we're talking about scrub and recoat now. Then I want to wet back that up, damp mop it, rinse with clear water, and then I'm ready to finish. Okay, now, once again, back to applying finish. I only want to put back on the floor what I've taken off. So what happens is, is that on an annual basis, on average, what happens is tra your traffic or the people in your building will walk off one coat of finish. If I use a general purpose cleaner, four ounces per gallon, I'll normally remove two coats. All right, and having the right floor pad is very important too. These new surface preparation pads are fantastic for scrub and recoat. I've seen too many people use black pads on the scrub and recoat. If you look at the construction of a black pad, it's wide open. It's designed to attack a floor. It can actually scratch the floor and you can actually see it. And blue pads and green pads are fine, but they're not going to clean as deep as the new surface spray pads. Now, yet there's a new pad, too, if you have really well-maintained floors and very shiny. Anybody ever uh, use, or is anybody using the, the, uh, the uh, Mr. Clean or Magic Eraser sponges? Okay. We actually make a floor pad now that's made out of that same material. And if you have really well-maintained floors, you can do a scrub and recoat with that pad, and it will hardly remove any finish at all. So applying the right pad to the floor is very important, too. Okay, once again, we really only want to replace what we're removing. So if traffic is walking off a coat and I'm removing two coats, then at most I'm only going to put about three coats back on the floor. 
Okay, once again, it's nice to have the right size crew depending upon the facility we're in and the floor we're going to be doing. Now, once we get our floor finished properly, maintenance is so important. Okay, daily dust mopping is the single most important thing that we can do from a preventative maintenance standpoint. And I want to share with you all, going back to that dust mop dressing I was talking about earlier, we noticed something. I, I don't know how familiar you all are with the hi history of Hilliard. We're 111 years old this year. Mr. Hilliard invented gymnasium finish. He's the father of speeding up the game of basketball. He started out as a disinfectant manufacturer, but he actually invented gym finish. So we're the world's largest manufacturer of floor care products, including gym coatings. Okay, one thing that we started noticing all over the world was is that when microfiber dust mops came out, and we love microfiber guys, don't get me wrong, microfiber wet mops and cloths, but what we found out is, is that microfiber dust mops, we were starting to get calls from customers that were seeing linear micro scratches in their floors. And what's happening is the microfiber dust mops, as you dust mop the floor and you make a turn and you want to shake out the mop, it's not releasing the sand grit in particular matter, so it's scratching the floor. So we thought, well, if it's doing that on gym floors, what's it doing to tile and terrazzo and hard floors? For dust mopping, we still recommend the old cotton properly treated dust mop. Hence the, the word properly treated. What we need to do is when we treat a dust mop is we treat the center wicks only, not the longer outer wicks, and we hang the mop up on a frame for 24 hours. That's where quality dust mop dressings have gotten a bad name. People will spray oil on a mop, they'll put it right on the floor, and they got a skating ring. So they must be properly treated. Okay? So dust mopping is very important. And by the way, has anybody found out better technique than taking a tennis ball on a broomstick or a black mark? If you ever find out anything better, please let us know. Okay. Okay. Now, walk off matter. The ISSA <coughs> says it takes about five to seven hundred dollars to remove one pound of soil out of your building on average. Now, that's not the soil at the front door, that's the soil that gets shotgun into the rest of the building. So the idea is if we have a minimum of 15 to 20 walking feet at the front door, that should effectively remove 85% of that soil off the shoe, therefore holding it at the door. Plus, what that also enables us to do is if we have a long enough mat, we can do what we call clean in place matting. So all we have to do is vacuum it. We leave it there. If you have a 3x5, a 4x6, or a 4x8 mat, what do you do? You vacuum it, you roll it up, you damp mop underneath it. If you have clean in place matting, it stays in place. And it also does a better job of holding the soil at the door. So industry experts say a minimum of 15 to 20 feet at the door is the proper amount of matting that you want. It's a worthwhile investment. And you can get it custom cut based on the perimeters and dimensions of your facilities and entryways. You know, I, that's one huge thing that when I do a building audit many times is I don't see enough adequate walk-off matting at the front door. And I like walk-off matting that will remove the particulate matter off the shoe, but also remove moisture as well. You want what we call an active mat. So having mat is so, proper matting is so important. Okay, so there's also another time that we recommend stripping, okay, and that is on new floors, okay. When a new vinyl composition floor goes through the manufacturing process, many times it is coated with a paraffin wax, but we, to remove it, we do not use floor stripper. This general purpose cleaner I was referring to earlier that we use for our scrub and recoat will effectively remove that paraffin wax off the floor with a blue pad and six ounces per gallon. Because if we put a stripper on a floor that's been freshly laid, okay, because normally we would like to have the adhesive cure for two to three weeks, if we apply the stripper to that floor, the solvents in the stripper are going to bleed that adhesive and maybe separate the top from the floor. So make sure you use a general purpose cleaner when stripping a new floor. or once again, if I'm changing a floor finish system, if I'm going to what we call a burnishing system versus a non-burnishing system, not all finishes are created equal. I might want to think about stripping. There's also a new term I heard yesterday from my brother down from Louisiana. Another reason why we want to strip the floor. What was that referred to as, Brandon? Cow pathing. 
cow pathing. Anybody ever heard the term cow pathing? It's the path that cows make in a field and they yeah, break it down. Yeah. Anybody ever seen four finished in a walk-off pattern? That's what he was referring to. Down from where he's from, they referred to it as a cow pattern. <laughs> so I learned a new thing for the thing. Also, if a floor is deeply scratched beyond repair, or I can't even scrub and recoat it to repair it, then I also want to strip it. But the thing about it is, guys, I want to control my finish buildup. I don't want to put so much finish on the floor that when I do have to remove it, that it's going to take me a tremendous amount of time. Okay? Most of the facilities that we deal with today want to get on a three to five year stripping cycle. Okay? Because we just don't have enough time to strip all our floors anymore, correct? And I will tell you guys, I saw, I was out in Colorado a few weeks ago, I saw a school that was a middle school and had a lot of kids, their floors looked first class. They had not been stripped in 10 years. They were as clear as a whistle. The gloss was outstanding. We put a gloss meter on there, it read about 85%, which 90 is about the highest you're going to go when you put our light readings on there. And what they do is they control their finish buildup, but they do the proper amount of routine maintenance and interim maintenance. So it can be done. All right? But they follow these procedures and these processes to the T. And that's what it's all about. Okay? So, once again, we, we need to make sure that we're using the right approach, whether we're doing interim cleaning or restorative cleaning. Now, I'll finish with this because I'm still running out of classroom time, which you all are probably going, thank God, we need to stand up again. Just know this, the average coverage ratio of a, of a gallon of floor finish is about 1,500 square foot per gallon. And know this, a gallon of liquid, if I just pour a gallon of liquid in this area, it's going to cover about 1,600 square foot. And it's going to be about one thousandth of a mil thick. Okay, if I take this finish that's 18% solid, one coat at 1,600 square foot is going to be about 18 one-hundred thousandths of an inch. So let me ask you a question. This plastic is 10 thousandths of an inch thick. Okay? Pass that around. So if this is 10 thousandths of an inch thick and one coat of that 18% solid finish is 118 thousandths of an inch, how many coats of that finish right there do you think it's going to take to get that amount of thickness on the plastic? Just take a guess. Quite a few. And that's the idea is we want to go down thin to win at 1,500 square foot per gallon, guys. Because the thicker we put on there, the longer it's going to take to dry, but it's not going to cure right and wear right. <coughs> Just to let you know, the thickness of that 10 thousandths of an inch plastic that I passed around, the equivalent number of coats for that 18% solid finish would be 55.55 coats. So we're not talking real thick material. Now, if it was a 25%, because I also have a 25%, it would be, 40, it would be 44 coats to get the same amount of mill thickness as that plastic. So what I'm saying here, guys, is a couple of things. Number one, it's so vitally important that we apply the product at the appropriate coverage ratio, but it's equally as important to maintain it, because once again, we have thousands of walking feet walking on very thin material. Okay, so doing everything that we've talked about, having the right walk-off matting, frequency of dust mopping, <coughs> You know, auto scrubbing versus damp mopping, doing scrub and recoat, doing restorative maintenance, burnishing when we can, and using restores when we can, will help impact that thin amount of basically plastic is what we're putting on the floor. Now, y'all have given me an hour and a half of your extremely important time this morning. And you're gonna give me a little us a little more time yet till lunch. But let me ask y'all a very serious question. Did y'all learn some, one thing new about what we do for a living this morning? Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. That's what it's all about. We want to share information. Now, I told y'all I was going to give y'all an 800 number, and I want y'all to have it. 
because this is the 800 number to the Hilliard Technical Services Department. And like I said, if you can't get a hold of your local rep, give us a call. We, once again, being 111 years old, we believe in long-term partnerships. We want to be just, we want to be a resource. You know, so many folks in this world today are getting real good at taking their product and dock, dropping it off of your dock, but that's where it stops. We want to be able to give you as much information and resources as we possibly can. So if you ever run into an issue, dial 1-800-365-1555. Five, five and ask for technical support. And you will actually talk to a chemist who also knows how to clean a toilet and mop a floor, I, pro I assure you. <laughs> okay? Because see, what we do is we do our own research and development at our company, so we pay people to figure out the best way to use these products so y'all don't have to. So when you read it on the label, that tends to be the gospel. Okay? So I thank you all very much for giving me some of your time this morning. It was a pleasure talking with you, so thank you. Appreciate it. You guys.